Κυρίες και κύριοι, καλημέρα και από μένα. Ξεκινάμε ε, τη δεύτερη συνεδρία ε, του σημερινού ε, πρωινού μας και ξεκινάμε από τη μεγάλη εικόνα. Σήμερα συζητάμε τη μεγάλη εικόνα πριν περάσουμε στις ε, ειδικέ πτυχές των ενεργειακών ζητημάτων που έθεσαν οι ομιλητές το πρωί με, τις, ε, με τους χαιρετισμού τους και τις εισηγήσεις τους. Έχουμε λοιπόν μαζί μας εξαιρετικούς ομιλητές, διεθνείς ομιλητές, experts με μακρά πορεία στον τομέα της ενέργειας. Και εγώ είμαι ο Νικόλας Φαραντούρης και θα συντονίσω μαζί με τον Κωστήτο Σταμπολή ένα πάνελ που νομίζω θα μας οδηγήσει όμορφα στα ζητήματα τα καθημάς της περιοχής μας. Ας δούμε λοιπόν τη μεγάλη εικόνα, ξεκινώντας στο πρώτο μέρος αυτού του πάνελ με τον κύριο Απόστολο Πετρόπουλο, ο οποίος είναι Energy Modeler at World Energy Outlook, ο οποίος ε, θα μας παρουσιάσει πράγματι το World Energy Outlook 2021. Κύριε Πετρόπουλε, καλώς ήρθατε. Περιμένουμε με αγωνία να δούμε ε, την παρουσίασή σας, να δούμε τις διαφάνειές σας και να ξεκινήσουμε τη συζήτηση με τους ομιλητές μας. Έχετε το λόγο. Γεια σας, καλησπέρα και από τη μεριά μου. Ονομάζομαι Απόστολος Πετρόπουλος και εργάζομαι στο Διεθνή Οργανισμό Ενέργειας από το 2017 και συγκεκριμένα στην ομάδα του World Energy Outlook και ο ρόλος της συγκεκριμένης ομάδας είναι να εξετάζει το πώς κινείται αγορά ενέργειας καθώς και να καταστρώνει σενάρια μακροπρόθεσμης εξέλιξης στο, του τομέα της παραγωγή, του ηλεκτρικής ενέργειας. Now we'll turn in English in order to facilitate also the conversation with the other participants. First of all, before to start, I would like to thank ENE for the invitation and for hosting us. Let's start a little bit about the current situation. So, economic recovery, it was the highest since 70s. We, we have a 6% increase compared to last year. And of course, it's put a pressure on fossil fuel markets and also on power markets. As we have already discussed, there is an increasing uh, trend on the prices. We have seen that, for example, the gas prices have increased over 300% and also the oil prices around 30% since January 2019. Weather-related factors, for example, from low water availability and also to calmer wind conditions, put another additional implications for the energy sector. Some people and experts are portraying this as the first crisis of the clean energy transition, but this is not valid. A clean energy transition is a solution, but not the cause of what we are feeling today. Of course, a new energy economy is emerging. In 2020, The global installations of wind and solar capacity reached around 250 gigawatts. And in 2021, the electric car sales at a global scale are expected to surpass 6.5 million in 2021. This is over 50% increase compared to the already high values that it has been recorded in 2020. Of course, pandemic is around us and puts an additional barriers on the energy access aspects. Just to give you an idea, in 2021, we do expect the people that they lack access to electricity to increase by 2%, and this is mainly coming from sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, COP26 provided significant momentum for clean energy transitions. We had a bunch of countries that they declared additional net zero targets out there, for example, India, Saudi Arabia, which is the largest oil uh, producer out there. And also, we had also the commitment in order to reduce methane emissions. But even if the momentum is high, we do expect in 2021 as, uh, also an additional rise to come on the CO2 emissions. In this year, we World Energy Outlook, what we are planning to, explore, to explore is where the world is heading, how the world is going to, to keep the door open to 1.5 degree scenario, and the opportunities and the benefits that lie along the way of this clean energy transition. 
Let's first have a look on what happened over the last two decades. We see a big increase on CO2 emissions, and in 2020, the global CO2 equivalent emissions reached around 40 gigatons CO2 equivalent. This led to an increase of over one, perce- one, uh, one degree of the global average temperature since pre-industrial times. And as you can see, this was the trajectory before Paris Agreement. We were expecting, in our baseline scenario, a really robust growth on CO2 emissions. This scenario of 3.5 degrees, which it will have really big implications for the whole planet. The, we will, will expect if this was valid and it, will, it was going to happen, to have much more intense and also frequent floods, heat waves and hurricanes that they will create an unsustainable planet. But thanks to economy, technological cost reductions and also policy measures around, this is where we are heading now in the reference scenario. In our stated policy scenario, we take on board all the latest policies that are out there and back up by additional and concrete policy measures, but we don't include the, the updated NDCs and also the net zero targets. This scenario is a scenario of 2.6 degrees, but still it's far away of the Paris Agreement goals. To date, countries that they have net zero pledges account around for 70% of global CO2 emissions. And if we take all these net zero pledges implemented fully and on time, this is where we are heading in the announced in our announced pledge scenario. This is a scenario with around 2.1 degrees, and it's, it's within the range of Paris Agreement. Taking on board also the additional declaration coming in class from Glasgow, for example, we are talking about India net zero announcement and also the methane commitment from over 100 countries in order to cut methane emissions by 2030 by 30%. We are heading to 1.8 degree scenario. This is the first time of the history that governments had put in place some policies in order to reach and well below two degrees scenario in the future. But what it's important to highlight here is that it's not it's it's that it's important the policy to be ambitious, but also the implementation, it's what it matters a lot. But still, there is a substantial gap between what it has been declared and what is needed in order to, f- to, to reach 1.5 degree scenario target, where it means that we, we reach carbon neutrality by 2050 at a global schedule. Here, you may see the picture of our reference scenario and how the different fuels are going to evolve. We do expect in this scenario a robust growth of energy demand and the fossil fuel share, it's going to decline slightly from 79% today to 75% in 2030. For example, in oil demand, we do expect to to bring back to pre-COVID levels by 2023 and to surpass 100 million barrels per day in 2030. The natural gas demand is expected to grow about 15% compared to today's level but the big winner, of course, it's renewables. And what we do see is that the solar and wind generation is going to triple over the coming decade. In the EPA scenario, the picture is different. For example, we do see a peak on oil demand and then a plateau and slight decline. This comes mainly from the oil use of cars. Currently, we have around 34 countries that they have set, set bans of ISIS. Recently, we listened also the climate uh, law in Greece that they, they are targeting in order to phase out IC sales, internal combustion engine sales by 2030. And also, this is also supported with a part of industry. For example, we have many manufacturers that they, they are declaring quite ambitious target towards electrification and also to phase out the petrol cars, for example, from their production lines. This, it means that the market share of EVs from today level, which is around 5%, it's going to reach 30% in 2030. Natural gas, we do expect 
a growth in the coming five years, but then there is a plateau and a decline. And this, of course, it comes mainly also from power sector due to the shift to renewables. As we said already, we do expect a big growth on the renewables, but it's even higher in our announced place scenario, which is a scenario that takes on board all the net zero blades there. And we do expect the capacity additions of solar and wind to reach 470 gigawatts, which is almost doubling compared to what we have seen today, and it's 50% higher compared to the stated policy scenario that it's our reference scenario. In our announced places scenario, we have two different pictures out there. On the one side, we have the advanced economies that what we do expect is to, to have a declining energy demand, and the role of renewables is going to increase. For emerging economies, for example, India, China, and developing Asia, we do expect also a growth to continue. And this growth is going to be split equally between fossil fuels and also renewables. Let's talk a little bit about coal. We heard before also that uh, the decarbonization of the power sector that's happening in Greece, but what is it's happening in the global picture there? Just to give you a sense of the magnitude, like the coal fire plants today made up 30% of the global CO2 energy related CO2 emissions in 2020. For this reason, it's really important. And first, if we want to phase out the, the coal, we want first to stop building new coal fire plants. But as you may see from the figure, this is not the case. The last decade, it has been recorded the highest levels of new coal fire plants additions at the global level. Today, we have over 9,000 power plants that operate over 100 countries that they run on coal. And if we just maintain these coal fire plants and we continue to operate them, it will take up 50% of the CO2 budget in order to reach 1.5 degree scenario. So it's a, a huge, it has huge implications for the planet, how we, we are going to handle not only what it's, we are going to build as a new, but also how we, we deal with the legacy of the infrastructure. So in our announced places scenario, what we do expect that if we take into account the plant and under construction uh, coal fire plants, we will still build around 350 gigawatts globally. But the positive aspect of, of the story is that, for example, the recent announcement from China, it's going to cancel around 190 gigawatts of these projects. How this is translated in simple words, it's that just this announcement, announcement is equivalent of the impact of the savings that are going to happen in the EU if it reaches net zero, uh, zero carbon neutrality by 2050. And if this happens, in 2030-40, it will be the first period of the history, the decade of the history, that we will not have new, car, uh, new coal fire plants additions out there. Of course, we need to talk about legacy, as I mentioned before and how we can handle that the, the, the coal fire plants that are already operating. For example, there is a range of portfolio out, out there. One option, it will be either to, to reconfigure them in order to be easy to co-fire like low carbon fuels, like ammonia and biomass. Another like plan, it will be just to, to, to couple them with CCUS. Another possibility, it's also just to keep them in order to, to make sure that they, they will uh, handle the flexibility and adequacy needs. Or even another option, it could be just to turn this plan to clean energy projects or to storage facilities. Despite the improvement that it has been done since the Paris Agreement, you see what it was a trajectory with the red line, then how it's, it's our reference scenario and what are if we translate the Glasgow pledges into quantitative uh, factors out there, there are still a big gap to close in order to reach the net zero goals by 2050. For example, if we look 2030, the gap between the reference scenario and the net zero, it's closed only by 20% if we take 
into account the announced pledges out there. And this is equally split between the targets that they have pledges and the, the, the targets that they don't have. And for this reason, it's really important to scale up the ambition out there. This 20%, it goes to 40% in 2050. And what it's really important to highlight there is that we need to act now because if we delay the action, then all the innovative technologies, for example, CCUS, hydrogen, advanced biofuels that's, that's needed, we, 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 we will not be able in the coming decades to bring it in the market in the share that it's really important and to create the enabling conditions in order to permit them to penetrate the market. This is something that we would like also in our reports, we were trying to highlight that the early action, it prevent us in order to do much, much more in the coming decades rather than what we are doing today. And it creates also another implication about legacy. If, for example, we continue building coal fire plants in the coming decades, then we need to handle with the operation of these coal fire plants in the coming decades if we don't have an early action on that. We saw before an ambition gap in 2030 where we estimated that it's around 14 gigaton CO2 equivalents. But the good part of the story is that around 40% of this, of this gap, it could be solely covered via cost-effective solution. What we, we talk with the cost-effective is that it comes without additional cost with the consumers. How this is translated in real terms now? First of all, there is a quite substantial component of wind and solar capacities, around 60% that it could scale up and to be that are already cost effective. Another part, it comes from the lifetime extension of nuclear and expansion also for high hydrogen power. Around, around 1.5 gigaton CO2 equivalent, it will be solely covered by methane abatement policies out there. There is, of course, also a part from energy efficiency. We are talking about one gigaton there. And of course, electrification of the transport sector is going to play also a key role out there. Of course, there is a 60% remaining gap out there where it's energy efficiency, material efficiency, and also what we talk already, the different advanced technology. CCUS, hydrogen, advanced biofuels, but even we don't expect to be competitive by 2030, it's important to start already investing on innovation and make them competitive in the coming decades. Otherwise, these technologies will be just stay in these premature levels, and this is really important. Another way in order to look and to understand a little bit what is happening on the clean energy transition on, on the global market, it's if we just look at the value of energy related resources and the different rate. For example, today we had 1.5 trillion in the global market. And of course, this is dominated by oil. The picture is not completely different in our announced pledge scenario. Oil still dominates the market. But what it changes there is about the trade. For example, over 50% of the trade, it, it, it's targeted from Middle East to developing Asia. Instead of in the past, for example, we had Europe as an important. This is not, important, uh, this is not anymore the case because we reached carbon neutrality in Europe by 2050 and also even in China. New players we have on, on board. For example, we had hydrogen that we were expecting to, to take a share of that. For example, the hydrogen uh, levels of, of uh, trading, it will be equal to today's level of coal. And we are talking about Australia that is going to export mainly to Middle East and also Latin America out there. And then the, we have also an, imp uh, uh, an, an important role that critical minerals Today we have mainly copper, but in the future we have also critical minerals that they play a role on batteries and we will talk a little bit later on that. And in our net zero scenario, just the critical minerals and the hydrogen combined, it's going to cover 80% of the global trade of the energy related resources. As you see today, we had still critical minerals, but it's mainly copper. In the future we have lithium, cobalt, 
and the rare earth that it's needed in order to supply the clean energy trans uh, the clean energy technologies and also of course hydrogen as an agency we identify importantly the role of critical minerals for this reason last year we 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 had a dedicated report to that and we are we are planning to look more closely on critical minerals part because if you want to to achieve this clean energy transition you need also to make sure that the supply is out there in in world energy outlook many times we highlight the need of the mid and potential risk of the mismatch on the investments on both oil and gas and also clean energy transition on the left side of the screen, you see that the oil, gas, natural production investments, the, it's more or the less flattening in 2021, it, and it's 50% lower compared to 2014 levels. But this is not translated on the demand terms. We don't see this a big drop on oil and gas demand in order to be translated also in, in the investment. This is a, an indicator that it's broadly aligned with our net zero scenario. But in this scenario, oil and gas demand, it's following a really a steep decline in the future. And if we see how it's going to evolve the situation in terms of clean energy technologies, this is a picture out there. In 2020, it has been proven resilient. We have a slight growth and even higher growth it's expected, it's expected in 2021. But a tripling is needed in our net zero scenario. So if we want to explain and to understand what is going on on the current situation about prices, we heard also from previous speaker to talk about that, this is, this is our explanation around there. For example, if you want to maintain and secure a reliable supply, you need to have the both pictures out there to, 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 be, to be done. It's not possible to rely on a low investment on oil and gas and not to invest a lot on clean energy and infra infrastructure investments. Let's talk a little bit about how consumers can be protected with price volatility and what is the role of clean energy transition out there. Today, this is an average household energy bills and 50% of this part, it's directed, of course, to oil use and mainly for petrol cars. Another 30%, it's, it's dedicated to electricity bills. And another 20%, it's dedicated to heating purposes, mainly from gas out there. What we expect in our reference scenario, it's a slight increase. It's going to happen mainly due to the higher levels of 2020 levels. We were not talking now about what we were seeing now. It's 2020 level that it's, it, we have seen a, a decline on both gas and oil. And we do expect more or less to increase in 2030. And in our net zero scenario, instead of having increase, we do expect a 10% decline. And why it's happening? First of all, oil and gas prices are expected to be lower because, of course, there is a balancing between supply and demand. We will have a lower demand on net zero scenario, so the prices are going to be driven down. Another important it's aspect of the story is that we are talking about lower shares of fossil fuels <coughs> and an increasing the share of electricity and also energy efficiency gains. For example, the new technologies like EVs or heat pumps are three to four times more efficient compared to conventional technology. And the key benefit on that is in order to running them, you need much lower annual cost compared to conventional technologies out there. Assessing in, in just a case that if this price shock is going to maintain in the future, we do estimate that in a net zero world, where we reach carbon neutrality by 2050 at a global level, consumers are 30% less uh, affected from the, from the impact of price shocks and the rise on oil and gas and also on coal out there. Of course, this is just a part of the story. Another part is how consumers are going to, uh, to, to afford at least for the midterm, the upfront cost. For this reason, governments are really important to support them, to put in place policies in order to incentivize and just to alleviate from the higher acquisition costs out there. As I saw previously, a new economy is, is emerging. And just to put you an understanding what is going on to happen, 
we have a big growth happening from different components. We have a huge capacity additions from batteries, wind, solar, electrolyzers, and fuel cells. We are talking about with for a $27 trillion market that is going to happen in a net zero world uh, by 2050. And in 2050, it's going to reach today's oil uh, global market. Of course, this creates a new opportunities. Not only it's going to tackle the climate change, but it will create new opportunities for innovation. Industry, it's, it's, it needs to look closely to that and to, to try to be compatible with these trends and to get also all the opportunities out there. Of course, there are cases, for example, in the case of coal mines, that people are, are going to, to have some job losses, but the role of the government there, it's really important in order to, to reskill the people and to create projects out there, like, for example, storage facilities, projects that, that are going to offset this drop. In our net zero scenario, we do expect in 2030, 30 million additional jobs to come at up globally and this more than offset the job losses that are coming because some industries are going to decline out there. Some key conclusions of our presentation. First of all, the transition, what we see and also uh, as already I highlighted based on our analysis out there, it's a solution, it's, it's not the cause that it's, it's creating this turbulence in the market. Secondly, and important, 40% of the gap that we see in order to reach 1.5 degrees scenario, it comes with cost-effective options. And this is important for governments to realize that and to ensure that a transistor and transition like that is going to happen. Another point is that as this mismatch in energy investment is going to remain, it will create potentially future risks about the price vola volatility out there. A new global economy is emerging. It's going to be more electrified, additional products to be out there. We have a huge growth on battery, electrolyzers, and other aspects of the industry. And lastly, and really important, governments have the capacity in order to transform the energy sector. In Glasgow, already we had some, some positive news, but a bit more to, we need to scale up the ambition in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Many thanks for, 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 the, for following me and happy to address the questions. Thank you, Mr. Petropoulos. Uh, it has been an excellent presentation of this uh, outlook. Uh, I wish to highlight um, a couple of uh, remarks you made before. First of all, that the well-designed energy transition will help tackling price volatility. But having said that, you mentioned and you stress and you highlighted that the world is not investing enough to meet its energy needs. Also, I would like to hear a little bit more about electromobility and hydrogen. You mentioned hydrogen as a future source of energy, uh, well promising. Would you like to uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes, uh, many thanks for the, for the question. So, in terms of price volatility, the key benefit of the clean technologies is, first of all, the efficiency component. As I mentioned before, for example, an electric car and also heat pump, it's three to four times more efficient compared to conventional technologies. So even if the prices of electricity, for example, reach the level of oil and gas, you have a benefit from the efficiency component. Another aspect of the story is as fast as we decarbonize the power sector, and the good news there, it's already renewables are cost competitive. We have seen, for example, already in 2020, that solar and, and wind in most part of the world, it's most, much more competitive compared, for example, coal fire plants or even gas turbines out there. So this is an aspect that it, it could secure also this price volatility. If we ensure that we are not relying anymore on fossil fuels and also on markets that we need to, to import, because the key benefit of renewable energy is that also that you can 
produced at domestically, for example, for the case of Greece. But of course, what we see is really a mismatch of what is needed to, to be done. For this reason, also as an agency, we highlight in that and we are trying to push in the direction in order to scale up the ambition. And we started already doing that on Glasgow. We have also, with the member states, uh, countries that are participating in the agency, to try to identify and to consult them in order to, to scale up the ambition out there. And in terms of electromobility, like the good news is that, for example, in 2020, we do expect a market share of 8.5%. Last year, we had 4.6%. Just China's electric car sales in 2021, it will be equal to last year's global values. So we see a transition happening. Of course, we need to advance more on that, for example, in our net zero scenario, we do expect that we need to reach 30% market share. But this happened in, in few markets. For example, in Germany, the last figures of uh, last month, they, they reached 30% market share of EVs. So, of course, additional efforts are needed, especially for emerging markets where there are, for example, it's limited electric car sales. But, of course, policies are needed to be done there. And another component that, like this year, they just announced that the electric hour batteries cost declined, even if the critical minerals cost has increased. So we see that there is a momentum out there, but governments, they need to scale up all of that. And just to comment a little bit about hydrogen, we do see... see for that, yeah. Any data regarding southeastern European markets, regarding electromobility? For example, uh, Greece, are approaching a 5% market share. Last year it was 2.5%. So already we see that happening also in Greece. I mean, because especially European market, it's really embedded each other. Absolutely. So, and also if you see that there are plans, for example, Volkswagen and other manufacturers, they have quite important uh, and ambitious plans in order to phase out sales out there. Recently, we saw also the, that there is a consultation phase, but there is a draft proposal from European Commission in order to ban IC sales by 2035. Of course, this, it will have a huge impact for all countries. Some countries will be the front runners, for example, France, Germany. Germany already, as I said, reached 30% share. France reached 23% share. But some others, they will going to follow. Otherwise, because it, it's not possible to, to follow, they are quite strict, the policies. So the, just to answer your question, it's happening also in our area in a slower pace compared to what's happening Definitely. in other markets. But there are some positive uh, news. For hydrogen, it gathers a lot of attention there. But still, it's, it's lagging behind on what is needed. For example, what if we put in place all the electrolyzer projects and also the pipelines uh, projects, it's around one third compared to what is needed and we do expect in our net zero scenario. So additional efforts are needed. We see that there is also a rapid interest and also more and more companies. We heard also for Greece the White uh, Dragon project out there. But additional things are needed in order to ensure that we reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, thank you, Mr. Petropoulos. You can bear with us. Uh, I wish to continue to our second part uh, of this uh, session and to address broader and general questions regarding how international energy regulation and institutions, geopolitics, but also current circumstances as, as the pandemic may affect the search for effective low carbon solutions globally and more specifically in our area. And I wish to invite Dr. Charles Elinas, uh, who's been a senior fellow uh, at the Atlantic Council and Visitor Research Fellow at ENA, top expert on oil and gas, uh, but also an energy expert in general. Dr. Elinas, the floor is yours. So thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. I think uh, ENA is to be congratulated for uh, managing to put this conference here in person rather than just uh, by Zoom. It makes a difference and I'm pleased to be here to make my own contribution in my own way. 
So my presentation is based on two events I attended uh, last month. One is uh, COP26 in Glasgow, and the other one is FLAME, the biggest uh, gas and LNG conference in Europe that was held in Amsterdam. And um, these events really covered the latest developments in both uh, uh, terms of climate change, but also energy developments and particularly flame, where the subject was obviously gas, not just uh, energy transition. And um, I will discuss some of the findings on, based, on, based on these events. So first of all, we all know that energy transition is unstoppable, particularly in Europe. Despite uh, the, the current energy crisis, the calls for faster transition at COP26 and everywhere else, um, and including calls for, uh, for drastic action are intensifying, and that isn't going to change. That is one way. For the first time, though, COP26 referenced directly fossil fuels, so even though the reference wasn't particularly clear or strong, nevertheless, it referenced fossil fuels directly. And that opens the way to limit their, their use in future uh, COPs, for example, next year in Egypt, introducing uncertainty and short-termism affecting longer-term investments in oil and gas. And I will cover that in my presentation. But increasing renewables and reducing, reducing gas in uh, flexible power generation will lead to increased volatility, as we know from what is happening now in Europe as clean energy technology has not yet scaled up to replace gas. Intermittency is still a problem. Politicians need to be honest about the cost implications of dealing with climate change. Their actions are making energy transition a costly and volatile process. But the rate of decarbonization, despite all of these COPs and everything that is being said, hasn't changed, and I'll show you a graph in a minute. On the other hand, uncertainties and regulatory risk discourage investment. Industry needs clarity and stability to invest on longer term projects. This is an interesting graph. It shows the change of CO2 emissions per unit of GDP globally against time. And it covers uh, almost a 30 year period. And you can see from that, that despite all of the agreements, all of the COPs, everything that's being said, the impact on that rate of change has been very small. It's remained constant for 30 years at minus 1.8% per year. Going in the, in the right direction, but partly because of increasing global GDP. And the, it, it begs a question. I mean, all, all of these things, we, we are, the future, future COPs, future meetings, are they going to cause a substantial change? Because really, to, to, to bend that curve, it will take a lot of additional effort, not just decisions at COPs, but practical measures by governments and others that are actually implemented, which is not happening. So the governments and activists become too hung up on net zero and forget about how to get there in an orderly, reliable and affordable manner. Often we hear what we need to do. We must do it. We must reach net zero. Otherwise, the whole system, the global system will fall apart. But nobody, nobody, even at COP26, the subject of how to get there in an orderly, reliable and affordable manner wasn't covered in sufficient detail. Practicalities and social impact of climate change matter. Consumers are price sensitive and will react if prices stay high. And will react by voting for those who promise them something different, promise them low cost energy. And all of the good things we are talking about here, about climate change, may not happen because consumers are seeing the impact of high prices, which is happening now. Security of energy supply does not come automatically. As we go further and further into renewables, intermittency will become more challenging until new technology becomes available to address it. It's not there yet. It, will, it is something that may 
take time. In response to the energy crisis and COP26 in our region, in the EastMed um, energy market, we need, we need reforms and uh, we need the right regulatory framework to deal with it. Clear policy and regulations are absolutely essential. We need to change direction. And some sobering thoughts. The often repeated statement that renewables is good, gas is bad, is too simplistic. As I said before, intermittency challenges this. The claim by politicians that dec decarbonization will not be costly is turning out to be nonsense. It is facing intermittency and the costs to deal with it. We need a transition that deals with security of energy supplies and decarbonization simultaneously and in a balanced way. This is an inconvenient truth for activists who concentrate on decarbonization alone, don't care about the balanced way. They pick on the first, but ignore the second, with all the consequences that come with it. Producers of fossil fuels reduced production last year due to COVID-19 and are holding back now, leveraging their advantage for higher prices. Any claim that they were unprepared for the rapid economic recovery this year or that there, is, there are insufficient reserves that is not stuck up. I mean, how can anybody say that the economy went down and will stay down? It was bound to come back. So how can anybody say that they were unprepared? So what does this mean for oil and gas? Gas is important for energy security, supporting orderly, orderly energy transition until renewable generation scales up and hydrogen is ready to play a serious role. We're not there, but the gas industry must move fast to low carbon and eliminate methane leakage. But a word of caution, batteries are playing an increasingly important role in dealing with intermittency. And as capacities increase, inevitably, they limit the role of gas as backup. There is a lot of pressure on international oil companies to curtail investment in new oil and gas coming from investors, environmental and climate, climate activists, and governments. But if they stop, the NOCs, the national oil companies, are ready to step in and make up the difference. And we're not going to see a change. See a change. The world is burning more oil, and we will carry on burning more oil, whether ExxonMobil or Shell or BP, stop producing it. The, I, the IA support this saying that current oil and gas investment is now broadly in line with the net zero requirements and does not expect the level of future investment to change significantly. But is that sensible? I'm not so sure about it. Indeed, majors, including ExxonMobil and Chevron, are not planning any significant increase in capital spending in the foreseeable future beyond the current massively reduced levels, which are down by 60, 60 to 70% compared to the highs of 2014, 2014. That must also include spending on low carbon projects, leaving even less to invest in oil and gas. In fact, ExxonMobil is considering abandoning some of its biggest future oil and gas projects. This does not bode well for these met and our dreams to develop our gas. The IEA said that available oil and gas reserves are sufficient to cater for future demand as this adjusts in response to pledges made at COP26. The world does not need more uh, oil and gas exploration, but existing discoveries still need to be developed to cater for depletion. European measures are influenced by their investors who are pushing them into, further into clean energy and net zero by 2050, the US majors rely heavily on external finance and are under increasing pressure to decarbonize while maintaining high dividends. That's why they are not investing in new projects. This is what uh, I was referring to. So in 2014, you can see where the level of investment in oil and gas was and where it is now huge reduction, and we're staying there, we're not going any further. So if, if the level of investment in oil and gas is that low, how can the oil companies invest in new projects? It's not possible. 
Gas demand, production and trading. Gas buyers and consumers were traumatized by high prices last winter. And they see a repetition now, but worse. This is not helping gas. It encourages users to look for alternatives and accelerates the drive for energy efficiency if prices stay high for too long. With the world needing even, even more energy this winter, oil and gas producers are in a strong position and are leveraging this to keep prices high. But high gas prices in Europe should drop down to normal levels by spring, especially once gas from deliveries increase further with uh, approval of NS2. With investments in doubt, this ascent, uh, unsettled energy situation will continue as transition progresses, leading to increased volatility. Prices going up, prices going down for some time. Green hydrogen, bio LNG, and other green technology will have to become price competitive against other fuels if they are to gain energy market share. They will, that will take time. The expectation is that most future natural gas demand will be in Asia, displacing coal and enabling renewables, not in Europe. And the Russian factor, which is always important when it comes to gas, Russia sees its gas exports growing in the future, but mostly to Asia in the form of LNG. At, at Flame, they, may, they, they talked about another 100, 150 million tons per annum of new LNG being planned. They're not planning any new pipelines except to China. Combined with Qatar's uh, plans, new LNG from Russia and Qatar is the cheapest in the world. This is likely to capture any new markets. So the dream of the East Met that we're going to go and develop new LNG projects and export our gas to the global markets is, is going to remain a dream as far as I'm concerned. Gazprom said that it has met its contractual obligations to Europe in full and that in fact, from January to October, supplies to these European partners actually increased by more than 13%. So financing new oil and gas is becoming increasingly difficult um, as climate pressure on fossil fuels grow, grows. The cost of capital is up, and it's banks that are going to make it difficult for the oil and, oil and gas company, companies, not just environmentalists. Golf, Goldman Sachs says that this year will be the first time in history that renewable power will be the largest area of energy investment. Natural gas has a role in energy transition, um, particularly in Asia, as I said before. But price volatility, finance becoming more challenging, and uncertainty about the future make investment decisions that much more difficult, affecting long-term investments in oil and gas, creating volatility, in other words. And a, a, a warning, a prematurely choking off oil and gas investment can trigger future shocks. And I believe it will lead to eventually to rethink about oil and gas and, and investment in oil and gas. Gas has a future, but the industry must develop a convincing narrative around its value in a decarbonizing energy system. This is what I was talking about. 10 years ago, the cost of capital for oil, oil and gas projects, it was down, it was 8 to 10%. Now it has gone to 20%. Renewables, it was uh, 6 to 8%. Now it has gone down to 3 to 5%. So it's easier to fund renewables, much more difficult to fund oil and gas. So the impact, I'm, I'm going to finish in a couple of slides, impact on these met where, where my interest lies. Natural gas developments and exports to global markets have not progressed in the East Met, mostly because of economic and market conditions. The East Met gas does not have the volumes needed to make a difference. It's only about 2% 2 of global reserves. It is expensive to develop and cannot compete in global markets. And not, don't refer to the gas prices now, which are uh, a spike, not, not long term. There are regional geopolitical challenges, disagreements on EZs and historical enmities and rivalries. But in my experience, when a project is commercial, oil and gas project is commercially viable and profitable, eventually ways are found to develop it. Once the pandemic and energy, the energy crisis are over, the well-known challenges that development of East Med gas has been facing will resurface. 
So drilling for hydrocarbons offshore Cyprus is about to restart. ExxonMobil is start, starting this month a present drilling in Block 10, uh, and before, um, but are we, are we heading for another crisis? So the geopolitical problems have not gone away. Turkey's position with regards to this and threats have not gone away. Are we going to have another crisis? It remains to be seen in world form. First, Cy but Cyprus has obligations to, in accordance with its, its contractual obligations with the oil companies, and it must adhere to those. It cannot get out of those, and the oil companies must do the same. But as I said before, I, international oil company interests have now changed and are even less likely to proceed with development of ESMED gas unless global markets undergo, undergo a major change and prices stay high for the longer term, which I don't believe is likely. Completion of appraisal drilling by ExxonMobil end of the year or early next year and other contractual obligations may be followed by a long period of inactivity. Is this the right time for change in the ISMED? My answer is yes, of course. The international oil companies are interested in immediate, easy and high returns, not long-term performance, something that is a challenge for the ISMED and so are exports to global markets. The ISMED must review the strategy for exploration and development of hydro, it's, a, it's a strategy for exploration and development of hydrocarbons, taking into account the latest global energy developments in line with the outcome of COP26 and EU's fifth of 55 and net zero for 2050 and all these good things, including the inexorable and rapid shift from fossil fuels to clean energy especially driven given the outcome of COP26. The future for this met is renewables, with natural gas discoveries made so far to be used regionally as backup to expanding renewables. The region should aim for 50% renewable electricity by 2030, backed up by gas in a stable manner so that we have a controlled transition. Pressure to do just that will intensify at COP26, 27 in Cairo, which is local, um, in, our, in our backyard, and pressure on oil and gas will intensify. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Elinas, um, for this uh, detailed presentation. Um, I understand you have been rather skeptic regarding energy transition and steps forward. For example, you showed that the rate of de decarbonization uh, in a slide, um, you demonstrated that it's going in the right direction, irrespective of whatever measures have been agreed over the past 30 years. Why does this happen? You have an explanation on this. <laughs> I mean, I, I, let's, let me correct myself. But I'm not, uh, energy, energy transition is happening. It's happening. We are part of it. My concern is that it should happen in, in an orderly manner. Okay. And that, uh, that graph I showed about decarbonization rate shows one thing, that all of these agreements, all of this, all of this work being done to convince us about the ways to get to net zero by 2050, mm -hmm. it's not having the impact that it, it desires to have. That decarbonization is happening at the same rate for 30 years. We have, we have had 20 COP meet, 25 COP meetings so far, and that hasn't changed. And the reason is because, first of all, there is, there is no carbon price, a global carbon, carbon price. In Europe, decarbonization succeeded because of, of having a price on carbon. It, it had an, an impact. We don't have sure. that globally. So it, it's not driven, there is no incentive to decarbonize faster. This is, uh, this is a, a major reason why it's not happening. So this makes institutional and regulatory initiatives in vain, for example? It's, it's not in vain, but uh, it's one thing to say what is good to be done and what we should be doing, and everybody. And I'm not so sure anybody will disagree with that, with the, all the good intentions. Okay. The question is, is reality. Um, what is actually happening? 
And if as a result of reality, we drive things too far too fast, we end up with instabilities, with problems, as we are having now. And it's one thing to say that um, intermittency in, uh, in wind intermittency in Europe is not the driver of current uh, of the current crisis. Nevertheless, it's a part. It's part of it. I mean, the fact that wind was not up to scratch meant that uh, meant burning more gas than usual, meant depleting reserves, meant shortages of gas for for the next winter and higher prices. So, it's the it's the realities of the of energy transition that matter, not just. Uh, uh, our targets, uh, targets are great. We, we need to have them and we need to drive for them. But what is reality? And um, for me, reality is, is going to come from people. Eventually, it will be a social factor. If, if people end up uh, with higher prices as now, eventually they will vote for those who, have promise, who promise something different. I see. That's a problem. And along this line, is this, in your opinion, the biggest challenge we are facing during energy transition? It is one of the biggest challenges, yes. And the, we need the, to so the social dimension? The, the, the social dimension forward. is critical. And we need to be careful because it's, it's great to aim for things to happen. But mm -hmm. if you take measures, like Germany has done, shutting down its, its coal plants, its nuclear power, too fast, too soon. It's not a case of not shutting them down. Eventually, eventually, they need to be shut down. It's the pace at which transition is happening. If we do two things too fast, and we haven't provided the alternatives to cover the gaps created, we get instability in the system, we get crisis, we get um, higher prices and all these problems that then drive the social factor and make it more difficult. We need a more a more balanced way to do that, and I think this is what uh, the, there is a mismatch between um, organizations like IEA that is doing a sterling job in in presenting us with all the right choices, and governments who whose life is four to five years, and the governments uh, don't don't have the same vision as IEA has. 2050. I mean, 2050 is too far away. The government in the UK is, is going to be uh, there for another three to four years. So they will take measures to make sure they're not going to lose the next election, sure. which is not necessarily compatible with uh, the ideal situation 20, uh, in, in, uh, in 30 years from now. So smooth transition is it's critical. Uh, is, is, is this and critical? we must pay attention to reality, be, yeah. be pragmatic. Will you give us, with a couple of words, the critical points towards a smooth transition? Who will? Uh, I think we need to hear, hear, to hear everybody at the moment. For example, at COP26, the oil companies were told not to come. Don't come. We don't want you there. That's short-sighted. They are part of the equation. You, can't, you, you, don't, you keep them out, then you have an unbalanced situation, unbalanced views. We need to hear everybody. We need to hear the IA. We need to hear. We need to hear the uh, Paris Agreement and everything that comes uh, after that. But we also need to hear the others who have a somewhat different view, and then develop a, a balanced approach. Yeah. Keeping the oil companies out, demon, demonizing them too soon, too fast. I don't think it's going to lead to a solution to the problem. Quite the opposite. Thank you, Dr. Elinas. We would like to come back to you um, to focus a little bit on uh, your cup of tea, which is Eastern Mediterranean yes. area. And I would like to demonstrate the geopolitics and the economics uh, behind developments in the region. Uh, but uh, let me uh, move uh, to our next speaker and come back to you afterwards during discussion. Let's invite and welcome Dr. Bassam Fatou, who has been director at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Dr. Fatou, good morning, good afternoon to Oxford. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I understand you. that uh, you will be covering the topic of oil and gas exporters and their transition strategies in a net zero emissions world. 
Absolutely, yes. Uh, first of all, as ever, it's always great to listen to Dr. Elena's insightful remarks. And uh, I would like uh, to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. It's always a great pleasure uh, to, to join you in these events. It's very unfortunate we were not able to meet in person. Um, as you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will try to focus my remarks on oil and gas exporters and the challenges, but also the opportunities that may, they face as the world transitions to net zero. And um, I will try to divide my, uh, my talk into two broad parts. Uh, I would like in the first uh, part to look at what strategic options do oil and gas exporters have in a world transitioning to net zero emissions. And the second question is whether oil and gas sector continue to have a role during the transition and what role that could be. Uh, but before going into these two specific themes, uh, let me start with one general observation as why it is important to focus on this group of countries. Uh, I think a key feature of climate change not always appreciated enough is the unevenness of its impacts on countries and regions. Uh, this is not only in terms of the physical impacts of climate change, uh, but also in terms of the economic adjustments uh, that are needed to reduce emissions and achieve climate targets. Uh, some countries, uh, particularly those that rely heavily on the hydrocarbon sector as the main source of their income and export revenues, will have to undergo much deeper adjustments and transformations. And this unevenness also applies to the capability to undertake these transformations. And even, one, even if one is to look within the group of oil and gas exporters, some are in a better position to cope with the challenges uh, than, uh, than others. So that is one aspect is the, you know, climate policies are gonna cause substantial distributional effects and reallocation of wealth. And oil and gas exporting countries are expect, expected to experience a decline in their incomes and wealth as the demand for their key export product is projected to fall. So I think this is one dimension. Uh, but I also think that oil and gas exporters can play an important role in being part of the solution to climate change and should be incentivized to play an active role. Uh, some key oil and gas exporters recognize the climate change challenge and have shown willingness to employ their technical and financial resources to tackle that challenge. And this trend should be recognized and it should be encouraged in climate change negotiations. So let me um, now move to the key uh, question uh, of my presentation. Uh, in a world transitioning to net zero emissions, what options do oil and gas exporters have to, com to confront with some of the adverse effect that could result from the transition? Of course, one option would be to diversify away from the hydrocarbon sector, uh, but there are limitations to this strategy. Most oil and gas producing countries face real challenges in realizing meaningful diversification, and particularly fiscal diversification that is needed to reduce the reliance of their government budgets on hydrocarbon revenues. Uh, also diversification into different areas aware from their core competitive advantage runs the risk of failure of establishing viable non-resource export sectors. Um, also, uh, achieving diversification requires extensive structural reforms to improve the economic and business environment, building a human capital, as well as removing barriers to private sector participation. And it's not clear, at least to me, how fast or even whether such extensive economic institution reforms can be implemented by most oil and gas exporters. And despite the decades trying to diversify their income sources, the, tra the track record has really generally been poor. And most oil and gas exporters find themselves confronting the challenge of that transition from a very weak position. But there are also other reasons I would add to this, is at the end of the day, the oil and gas sectors remain and still enjoy high margins than any new industries or sectors that these governments are aiming to diversify into. Uh, also, governments can leverage on oil and gas revenues to ease the pain of structural reforms and transition and the energy transition. Also, given the speed of the energy transition is highly uncertain, its impacts are uneven across the globe. And exiting too early from such an established strategic sector, sector deprives these countries of an important source of income and a source of competitive 
advantage. Also, this country should be prepared to take advantage of potential dislocations that that transition can induce. Um, after all, the pace of the energy transition is highly uncertain. It's not linear. It's going to be disruptive, and it's going to be highly uneven. And there are opportunities that these countries could still capture, even in the traditional forms of energy. Uh, one example of such dislocation is the possibility that oil supply uh, could fall much faster than demand due to lack of investment or due to IOCs shifting their portfolios away from oil or the inability of some oil exporters to increase their productive capacity due to financing constraints or even instability. So the question is, if diversification has its limits, what other policies can these countries pursue? Uh, some, part, some countries, particularly those in the Gulf, can compete effectively on cost. Their cost of extraction and development of hydrocarbons is the lowest in the world. Also, in the face of uncertainty about demand and in response to oil, oil substitution policies, some exporters can decide to adopt faster extraction and monetization strategies. But again, the lack of fiscal diversification and the high social costs of production act as a constraint on this strategy. Uh, increasing supply in a face of slowing demand could result in lower revenues, at least in the short term. In the medium to longer term, rapid monetization, high output policy can work for some countries, uh, but that basically requires a lot of conditions uh, to happen. But this is not the only consideration. In response to faster monetization, oil importers may decide to implement carbon taxes and capture a substantial part of the rent. And actually, this is nothing new. As you know, importing countries, especially in Europe and Japan, have always taxed uh, fossil fuels heavily. And although this was not motivated necessarily by environmental considerations, the underlying motivation basically makes no difference in terms of importing countries capturing substantial part of the rent at a time when those countries need those rents in order to transition and basically help to diversify their economies. Uh, some, some people argue, what about diversification into energy intensive industries? Uh, certainly, oil and gas exporters can diversify into sectors where energy is an important component of competitiveness, like petrochemical, steel, cement, fertilizers, and this could create a range of higher value added uh, products. Uh, but this strategy is also not without risk, uh, because industrialization into energy intensive in industries increases domestic of emissions of greenhouse gases, and some importers, such as the EU, are already developing policies to measure and verify the carbon content of some final goods and have plans to implement carbon border adjustment uh, measures. So that is why I think, you know, one of the key points that I would like to emphasize in my remarks is that in addition to competing in cost, hydrocarbon rich countries should also compete in reducing their CO2 emissions. And this is where I think CCS could play uh, uh, carbon uh, storage uh, sorry, carbon um, uh, uh, carbon uh, storage could play a central role in their development strategies. I believe competing on reducing emission is key to increasing the resilience of this strategic energy sector in a world where policies to reduce emissions are being implemented at an increasing rate. Now, of course, when we talk about this strategy, perhaps to many people, the most obvious strategy is to invest in renewables such as solar and wind. Uh, However, uh, and despite the fact that most oil and gas exporters have great potential for renewable energies, and they should accelerate investment in renewable energy, at the end of the day, the margins in renewables cannot fully substitute for the rents generated by the hydrocarbon sector. So that's why exporters should also work towards ensuring their production process and core hydrocarbon products and also compete on the emissions from. And again, you know, I'd like to emphasize the, the point of uh, CCS, because it can provide them with an opportunity to contribute to climate change action, but also to continue to monetize their reserves in a more sustainable way and retain the competitiveness of their oil and gas sector and energy intensive industries in a carbon constrained world. I think that not leading on CCS could risk undermining their competitive uh, position. Um, it is of strategic importance for large oil and gas reserve holders, either individually or as a group, to implement more projects to prove CCS technology at scale reduce its cost and develop sustainable business model. Of course, this is going to result in them 
achieving lower rents, but I think this should not be seen as cost, but actually should be seen as investments that could increase the competitiveness of a key sector in a world transitioning uh, to, net, uh, uh, to net zero. Um, and But having said that, you know, you, you know, and like Dr. Uh, uh, Elena has just said, is that, you know, trying to shift all the costs to producers and all the responsibility uh, to the producers, I don't think that is likely to, uh, to work. At the end of the day, all the stakeholders along the oil supply uh, chain will benefit from the CCS, and therefore the cost of deployment should be shared if basically CCS to emerge as a key mitigation strategies. So let me conclude. I know perhaps I've taken more time than was uh, what was dedicated to me, but let me try to conclude with some general observations. Some exporters are willing to be part of the solution and even lead on initiatives to fight climate change. But there must be a recognition of national circumstances that there will be various transition paths depending on start, starting points, core competencies and existing assets. Insisting on a single path could delay the transition. Actually, it could not it could actually result in not enabling the use of the technical and financial resources of producers. It can perpetuate non-cooperative behavior and increase the cost of the transition. Uh, providing frameworks that don't discriminate against certain technologies or fuels is quite important. And actually to allow technologies to compete and not try to shift costs to oil and gas producers alone, I think this is also quite uh, important. And that's why in my research, where I've been emphasizing the importance of developing burden sharing mechanism and integrate these into the multilateral and bilateral framework. Uh, of course, at the end of the day, it's very strategic for oil and gas exporting countries to show leadership in mitigation technologies such as CCS. But again, you know, uh, this should be done in, in a spirit of cooperation where basically the energy transition try to bring everyone and to try to include basically everyone and everyone to be part of the solution. And with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatouh, um, for your excellent presentation. In your, in your remarks, you presented carbon capture and storage system as being essential, an essential technology for, for oil and gas exporters if they are to compete in a carbon constrained world. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you um, to elaborate a little bit more on what do you think is special about carbon capture and storage system? What competitive, for example, advantage do oil and gas exporters have in, in this carbon capture and, and storage uh, um, context? I, I think there are two, two dimensions to this uh, question. Um, uh, one question is related to global climate action. Uh, deployment of CCS is needed to help achieve the goal of net zero emissions, given that oil and gas are projected to remain part of the energy mix, at least for the foreseeable uh, future. Um, for some energy intensive, hard to abate sectors, such as steel and cement, where many of the oil and gas exporters see competitive advantage, technical options to reduce em emissions without CCS are currently very limited. And in fact, actually, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report in 2018 showed that uh, most scenarios would assume significant CCS, otherwise it would not be possible to limit the temperature rise to one and a half degrees. And actually what they show is that CCS uh, could also reduce the, uh, the cost of meeting climate targets. So I think there is this gl global dimension, but I think the other dimension, which is uh, related to oil and gas exporters, I think that CCS is a climate mitigation action through which some oil and gas exporters could establish a competitive advantage. And this is, has to do with the fact um, related to their natural resources, for instance, their geological storage capacities, uh, their access to depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs, and their existing infra infrastructure. Uh, but also I would, I would add technical resources, for example, their expertise in subsurface uh, technology. So despite the fact uh, you know, that the CCS can actually provide a way forward for these producers. What we see that, that there's a lot of skepticism about the role of, uh, of CCS and some of the debate that I see is moving in the direction of trying, you know, to pursue supply side policies, which aim to 
uh, you know, for instance, keep oil underground, keep gas underground, you know, to limit the investment in, in these sectors. And basically, you know, without considering, you know, CCS and without basically providing enough support for the CCS. And I think those type of supply side policies are really not, not helpful if you want uh, the, the producers basically to be part of the transition and to be part of the solution. As I said, um, which I believe that some of the oil and gas exporters can be part of that. Thank you. But uh, speaking speaking about investments, if CCS is essential, as you said, to achieve climate targets, shouldn't we shouldn't we see more more investment in CCS than currently uh, is? Uh, shouldn't oil and gas exporters demonstrate leadership and lead in this technology? Um, absolutely, they 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 should demonstrate uh, leadership uh, because, as I said, it is in their interest. Um, uh, it is basically in their interest. Uh, to uh, to be leading on those technologies, but unfortunately, so far, what we have seen is that most of these projects are develop uh, are being are being pursued in developed uh, countries, particularly in countries like the U.S. and Norway. And we haven't uh, seen uh, you know the big oil and gas producers uh, pursuing this. And I think this has to do with the fact uh, you know that the supportive scheme, the incentive structure, the regulatory structure has not basically pu uh, been put in uh, place. At the end of the day, uh, this is um, a costly technology. Uh, of course, costs can go down, but you know, at the moment we don't have uh, you know, enough economies of scale. We don't have basically a deployment of CCS at a large scale. And what you need is basically the governments uh, to provide support, uh, but also the, uh, the, 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 the climate uh, uh, the climate finance mechanisms also to, to enable some of these investments. So oil and gas producers should lead uh, on these technologies, but at the same time, you know, shifting the cost, every, you know, shifting all the costs just to oil and gas producers and trying, you know, to, uh, you know, on top of that, trying to capture part of the rent which is being generated at the time when these countries need those revenues in order to diversify their economies and to transition, you know that is not going to enable that uh, that technology. So I think you know it's again. You know, are we talking about a, an inclusive energy transition or 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 not? And I think there's plenty to be done in order you know to enable you know to uh, to enable uh, the deployment of this technology in some of these oil and gas exporting countries. So I hope that answered your question. Um, it, you know, at the institute we're doing a, a lot of work. On, um, on trying you know to find some of these mechanisms uh, within the article 6 of the of the paris agreement uh, you know to see you know how can revenues flow in order basically to allow uh, for the deployment of those uh, technologies in, in in oil and gas exporting countries and in developing countries in general Thank you, Dr. Fatouh. Uh, very interesting. We'll come back to you. Thank you for uh, being here with us. Bear with us. And may I uh, welcome now Dr. Leo Drolas. Is Dr. Drolas with us? Good morning, Dr. Drolas. Dr. Drolas is an independent energy consultant in London. Good morning to London. The floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning and uh, I would like to thank my good friend Kosti Stambolis for the invitation. I have spoken on many uh, occasions, on many such uh, meetings, gatherings in Athens. I'm not actually in London. I am in Greece. Oh. Um, the, the joys of Zoom uh, cannot tell you these details, but I'm in uh, southern Greece in the Peloponnese. Um, but, and it's a lovely day, so I'm... Uh, better off, Dr. Drolas. Yes, I think it's quite a bit better than uh, London. Anyhow, uh, I listened with great interest to the presentation so far uh, from the IEA, of course, um, whom I visited many times. And uh, to, I've listened to Dr. Elinas and Fat, uh, Dr. Fata Fatou. Um, so it's good to be with uh, friends, so to speak. Um, but I shall take, uh, be taking a slightly different line um, as you would expect from someone who's been in the oil and gas business for 45 years now um, and been in the heyday of, of, of oil, certainly, and gas. Um, my, my problems, you will soon see what I have, my issues with the, the current uh, trends. Um, 
This is um, a quote from Carl Sagan, the em eminent planetary scientist and astrophysicist, um, which shows how you can go wrong with predictions. He said uh, in 1974, he wrote in his book, Broca's Brain, that with the depletion of fossil fuels, I think it very, un very likely that automobiles powered by internal combustion engines will be with us for at most a few decades longer. Well, it's, um, it's a long time since then, since that quote, and the, this uh, prediction has not uh, materialized, of course. We have gone in, in the other direction. So uh, it's, one must be careful about uh, what we wish for and what we think will happen, because um, history and life itself has a, has a tendency to uh, make fools of us who, who think that we can foretell the future. Uh, just to set the scene, uh, when I was completing my studies in the mid-70s, uh, the main concern then was about the uh, onset, the imminent, in fact, onset of an ice age and uh, the depletion of oil and natural gas resources, hence uh, uh, Professor Sagan's remark that I gave you before. Uh, by the 1990s, of course, mankind's preoccupation has shifted uh, in the opposite direction, the fear of an increase in CO2 and its impact on mean global temperatures. Um, I won't say anything about uh, what is the elephant in the room, really, whether all this the net zero business is necessary, uh, as indeed is the wider issue of whether CO2 drives global temperature rises. And there are quite a number of theories, uh, counter theories, if you like, uh, and a lot of people are discussing these. But of course, they're not just the, the, the whole issue is just swept under the carpet. My worries today have more to do with, as I say there, it, the speed of the transition, which Dr. Elinas has also mentioned, from fossil fuels, which, uh, let us remember, um, occupy the 83% of global primary energy in 2020. Um, the other issue is where, which countries and which social groups will bear the main burden of, of such a global concern. Um, it's... Uh, if it's true that CO2 drives global temperature rises, then it's a global concern and not an, just individual countries transitioning. And of course, the most important from the economic point of view is what will be the overall cost. Um, as has been often touched upon, relying solely on wind and solar power to drive motor transport, space heating and industrial needs um, it requires backing up, either by natural gas, nuclear power, or battery power. Um, so this, this is a big concern, and, and the costs are enormous, which I will touch upon. But back to um, primary energy, uh, you can see that I have, uh, I give you the, the main components of primary energy. And um, at 31% in 2020, which was a, a year uh, with the pandemic, um, uh, creating chaos, uh, still uh, oil, the oil share in primary energy was still at 31% the highest. Um, Greece, incidentally, as you can see there from the, the green column uh, under oil, Greece has the highest dependence on oil, 51% uh, in 2020 in Europe, because of its heavy use of oil for space heating alongside the more traditional usage of oil for transport. Uh, in terms of renewables, it's interesting that Greece itself uh, has a higher percentage than the EU average. Um, so it, in that respect, it's doing quite well. But of course, it has no nuclear energy. And um, uh, its, its coal usage is, is still a slightly above the uh, EU average. But in terms of renewables, uh, Greece hasn't done too badly so far. Uh, in CO2 emissions, I have formed an, an index here of emissions to make it easy to understand. From 2010, which is one, you could see how the index is moving for the various uh, countries and regions and groups of the world. Um, you can see that uh, 2020, with the pandemic raging, um, showed that uh, emissions declined in all these countries and regions, apart from China, where they increased slightly. 
Um, of course, in uh, China's uh, uh, emissions still remain 20% above what they were in 2010, and India's emissions of CO2 are 40% above um, what they were. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, the EU's emissions and, and the United States have gone down um, uh, to around 20% below what they were 10 years ago. And uh, that, of course, is good. Greece's um, emissions are, have declined by 40%, which is, again, when I did the calculations, it was quite remarkable. Um, in the, the EU's decline was, has been mainly through government fiat, government efforts, uh, whereas in the US, the decline in emissions has been a, a, a trans transition away from coal towards natural gas, which uh, was you know, due to the great discoveries and the cheapness of natural gas, the great shale gas discoveries. Um, and now to the, to, the, to the future, so to speak. Uh, primary energy consumption per capita uh, in, in, in the world has been increasing gradually in the last 20 years by half a percentage point per annum. Um, of course, as you'd expect, the OECD countries um, led by the US uh, and the EU, uh, primary energy consumption per capita has declined. Um, but there are regions uh, like Asia, the Asia Pacific region um, and, and the, the non-OECD countries as a whole where uh, primary energy consumption is rising per capita. Um, I would suggest that Africa, uh, if you can see there, its, it's um, consumption per head, primary energy, is 20% of the global average. It's very low, uh, while the Asia-Pacific Asia area's energy usage per capita is still 37% of the OECD uh, average. So the, those two regions, especially Africa, have a huge potential to increase uh, primary energy consumption per capita in order to improve uh, the lives of their populations uh, and, and a transition, if you like, to use that term, into uh, the, um, the modern developed uh, era. So that is a, a pointer that those regions will continue to need a lot of energy. And um, it depends on what the, 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 the costs of transitioning to other forms of energy are like it to be. But I would suspect that oil and gas are going to form um, a, a key component uh, of, uh, of those country, as countries and regions' development. Um, I think the previous speak speakers mentioned that uh, investment uh, in oil and gas has been declining. Uh, here you have the result of, of, of the general decline in um, the effort to discover oil in this case. And the next slide will show you the gas situation. Um, gross additions to oil reserves, which are not just uh, wildcat discoveries, but also uh, extensions and revisions to existing um, uh, uh, oil and gas um, fields, um, you can see that these gross additions have been on a declining trend. There was a little shift upwards in 2017. Um, and um, but then it's down again. The reserves to production ratio of the year uh, of the, for the for the world as a whole um, has um, declined from the you know the mid 50s, 55 years uh, or so in, in 2010 uh, has declined to the 50 year uh, level. So we've lost about four or five years worth of, uh, of reserves to production. Um, but the 2020 jump up is due to the obvious decline in, in consumption of oil um, and, and the consequent increase in, uh, due to the pandemic, of course, and the consequent increase in the RP ratio. So if we go to natural gas, uh, the, the, the picture here is very similar. In fact, it's probably more stark. Uh, world gas reserves to, to, to consumption in this case, how many years cover do we have of uh, global natural gas reserves? These have declined from 57 years of cover to 49 years in 2020. Again, a little increase in 2020 because of the decline in, in, uh, in hydrocarbon consumption in general. Uh, again, the global natural gas discoveries, as uh, gross discoveries, 
in the form of additional gross additions to reserves, uh, has been um, generally on a declining trend from the early, uh, you know, from 2010 and before. Um, there are, of course, years when it jumps uh, because discoveries are just added in, uh, suddenly uh, due to chance discoveries, etc. But the 2020 picture is certainly one of the lowest we've had for some time. So um, the, the, the picture is similar in those two. It just confirms what uh, previous speakers said. When, you, when investment drops, um, uh, as it has done in the last uh, years, from, for example, in, uh, in 2014, the investments in uh, oil and gas um, developments were around the $900 billion mark, and they've declined to $340 billion in, in the last year or so. So there's been a huge decline. The previous speakers have alluded to that. Um, so it is a real problem. Before I go towards the, um, the, 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 the solutions, if you like, um, I would like to point out a few important considerations regarding wind power, which is, of course, one of the, the great white hopes of, of uh, the transition. We must remember that wind is a fluctuating stream of low density energy and the bets limit caps the energy that can be extracted from a moving fluid. So uh, wind turbines are already effective machines in extracting wind energy. The problem is the wind, wind itself, which um, the British science writer Matt Ridley wrote, uh, um, is unreliable. Mankind stopped using wind power for mission critical transport and mechanical power a long time ago, and for sound reasons, it's just not very good. Um, I, you might not be, uh, the general public might not be aware of this, but uh, the turbine's propellers appear to turn lazily. Uh, we've all passed them, uh, but they, their blade tip speeds average around 240 kilometers an hour, very, very rapid uh, speed at the, at the end of the, of the blades, which, which is why a lot of uh, birds and bats are killed by them. Uh, more importantly, from the economic point of view, a two megawatt turbine, and now there are much bigger ones planned, weighs about 250 tons, and its manufacture requires 150 tons of coal to make the steel structure and the cement base. And the rare earths for the magnets generate epic, as I say here, pollution, but it's out of sight in faraway places like Mongolia. So uh, wind power is not that clean, really. Moreover, they require space, uh, quite a bit of space. GE's two megawatt turbine with a rotor diameter of 127 meters needs to be almost 900 meters away from, the, they need to be from each other. Each turbine has a life cycle of around 20 years, needing 15 years for payback. And operation and maintenance costs, maintenance costs can be significant. So those are considerations that are often swept under the carpet. But the main problem for me with wind power uh, is the, is the, what the so-called load factor, the wind power load factor, um, is an unreliable resource, as everyone knows. And its, its capacity to deliver electricity, to generate electricity, is never fully used because either the wind is not blowing or it's blowing too much and the turbines have to be switched off. Um, they also need time in a, in a year, I, I've uh, used 15 days as an average to, for it to be set aside for maintenance, and also they break down quite often. The load factor, of course, measures electricity generated as a percentage of rateable generating capacity. And here's the problem, that the world as a whole had a, in 2020, uh, an average wind power load factor of only 27%. The US, of course, has a much higher percentage. Uh, it had in 2020 of around 20, uh, 36%, as did uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, Greece's uh, load factor, wind load factor, is uh, about the world average. Uh, China's is a lot lower. So um, the problem, of course, that entails is that you have to find backup when the wind is either blowing too hard or not enough. And um, that backup is, makes the cost of wind uh, a lot higher than people uh, imagine, who, uh, people who concentrate only on the actual 
uh, physical cost of building the turbines uh, and the, uh, the electricity generated. So the cost is, if you like, hidden uh, because you have to have backup systems, which at the moment are mainly natural ga gas, which is why Greece, uh, in the recent, the recent period when it wasn't uh, the wind wasn't blowing, uh, had to, uh, to rely a lot on on natural gas as the backup. And um, the natural gas costs, as we all know, went up very high. Um, at Greece, I think, uh, latest um, wholesale power uh, cost it has exceeded uh, 200 euros per megawatt hour, which is way, way beyond four times higher than it used to be only a few months ago. So that shows you the, 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 the practical difficulties if, if, you, uh, if you rely too much, if you like, on wind power because of this load factor consideration. So um, this is my main message of, as far as uh, wind power is concerned. So um, just to conclude, um, to, to, uh, to achieve net zero emissions of CO2, which Europe is uh, uh, targeting, um, a, a number of areas of fossil fuel usage need to be replaced with a renewable energy, obviously. And the one for Greece that, that is of concern is that Greece uh, has a highly urbanized uh, um, population uh, for I think over four million uh, people live in the A Greater Athens area, and Thessaloniki has uh, also quite a large population. I think one and a half million. So most of Greece's population lives in, in urban, uh, uh, large urban conurbations, and uh, uh, help uh, uh, allowing the charging of vehicles in in narrow streets in buildings uh, with four to five stories high. Is, is a bit of a nightmare, really. So um, I think people, uh, the government is not, hasn't thought enough about the, the infrastructure in, in these large urban areas. To, to use wind power to supply electricity for these large planned EV fleets, um, tens of thousands of additional wind generators will be needed, costing many bills, billions of euros and needing a lot of space and infrastructure expenditure for access roads, transmission lines, etc. Uh, I have dealt elsewhere in another presentation with the, with the great details of all this and the losses of transmission uh, and, and uh, charging, charging losses. Um, Gas-fired or other power systems obviously need to be available as backup and or extensive uh, storage systems developed, increasing, as I said earlier, the cost of wind power. Finally, last but not least, as they say, Activism, activist investors, as uh, the previous speakers have, have uh, pointed out, are shunning hydrocarbons, which will have, for me, two very undesirable results during the transition period. First of all, their prices will be higher than otherwise would have been the case, causing general inflation and fuel poverty for the vulnerable, which is already something we are seeing right now. Um, and um, secondly, Global dependence on oil and gas production in geopolitical, politically volatile regions will rise. Uh, we have, I have been, uh, I have lived because of my age through um, the, the you know, previous uh, geopolitical upheavals stretching back uh, to the 70s, the early 70s. And the biggest uh, uh, problem to have hit the world which changed our, the way we uh, our industries operate has, was the were the two oil price crises of the of the seventies, which uh, transformed um, our economies. Uh, and many people would say for the better, but uh, certainly they caused huge upheavals. And and uh, this transition, which is planned uh, to net zero, certainly in Europe. Um, Will, will cause uh, very huge upheavals, I, I would suggest, that might even dwarf the ones we saw uh, 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 in the 1970s. So I'm afraid um, I can't join in with the IEA in this uh, uh, rose-tinted vision of the future and how, how we could achieve all these targets. I think it's going to be uh, very, very difficult and it will cost the earth, as they say. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I look forward to any questions you might have. 
thank you very much, Dr. Drollers, for uh, your uh, detailed presentation. is uh, is is really impressing how dependent uh, are on fossil fuels countries and areas, and in particular some se sectors as transportation or uh, heating, um, uh, space heating, etc. Do you th believe that the speed of the transition away from hydrocarbons then in Europe is too high? Obviously, the answer is yes, F far too high, far, far too high. And moreover, if Europe alone does it, um, and other parts of the world, especially the Far East, uh, China is the obvious example, if they don't follow, um, then Europe is really, many people have said this, shooting itself in, it, in, in both feet, not with a shotgun, but with a cannon. Um, I'm, I'm afraid uh, the prices are already in Europe much higher than the United States, um, and, and it's going to be heading further uh, the, the, the apart from the US and, and especially you know, countries in the Far East, um, which, of course, China already is the workshop of the world, and I can't see that changing. Well, I can see that Europe uh, uh, will, will be heading uh, in, in an opposite direction, will, will become mainly, I suppose, eventually a tourist attraction. People come to see the ancient, the ruins, uh, but, but there won't be much uh, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, great industrial growth and production. So I'm, I'm very pessimistic, and uh, I think Europe should think very carefully about what it's doing. When we say Europe, we mean very, really the European Commission, which is not uh, answerable to any, uh, uh, directly to any uh, voters, uh, as, as Dr. Elena said, that you know, when it comes to people voting and when they are facing fuel poverty, as a lot of them are today, um, the objections uh, will increase the, the, and even lead to uh, further you know, problems and rioting even. So it's not a pleasant um, future um, and, and people need to um, think very carefully about what is happening. By the way, may I suggest that... Um, if, if people should, the elite, so to speak, in inverted commas, should be reading more of the, uh, of the comments made by people in, in, the, in social media and in response to COP26, et cetera, where, where the, the, the public in general are very much against, and they think that all this is some cooked up, um, uh, cooked up plan to, uh, to, to keep them in, in, in power and in control and, and uh, leave people, the, the general public, uh, in, in, in impoverishment. So uh, this, these are serious issues that will, will have repercussions. And I think the government should be alert to what's going on and, and be more closer to people and what they think and not, and by, by this I mean, uh, 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 people who, are, who have knowledge of these issues, and there are many, many of us, because education levels have increased in leaps and bounds in the last 30 or so years. So there are many well-educated people who understand these issues and have read a lot about them. Thank you very much, Dr. Drollers. I would like to come back to the social dimension um, in, during discussion, if we have time. Thank you again and now may Thank i you. welcome mr tim yeo is the mr tim yeo with us chairman of the new nuclear watch institute in london uh, thank you yes i'm with you and i hope good, everyone good can morning hear me. good morning to london good morning mr yeo hello i can tell you london the sun has been shining this morning <laughs> although it's probably about 20 degrees colder here than it is where anyone other participants uh, situated. Um, can I say I'm delighted to take part today and I warmly congratulate IENI and particularly uh, Kostis Stam Stamboulis, who I guess is a friend of all of ours, on organising this as a hybrid event with both um, physical and online participation. I much regret I'm not actually with you in Athens myself. Um, there's been some very authoritative and interesting presentations already this morning and some welcome um, I think provocation from the last presenter, uh, Leo uh, Jollis, um, which I'm tempted to 
address directly, but I'll pause until we get perhaps to the discussion. And the comment I would make is I think the majority of the younger people I know, and when I say younger, I mean people under the age of 35, I take a rather different view about the urgency and seriousness of the threat of climate change from, from some of the older people. Um, as usual, there are lots of uncertainties in the energy uh, scene right now, but the priorities of consumers uh, remain the same. They want energy which is cheap, uh, secure, uh, but increasingly also energy which is green. Uh, and indeed, in my judgment, the third of those three priorities um, uh, is increasingly the most important one, even though 20 years ago it wouldn't have rated a mention at all. The message I got from COP when I was there and also watching on, on the media was that the world is moving towards more sustainable energy, but it isn't moving fast enough. And that, I think, was very clear from um, uh, uh, the introduction from um, uh, Dr. Petropoulos from the uh, IEA. Um, but it was significant that for the first time, the COP26 conclusions included a reference to the phase down of unabated coal. And of course, next year in Cairo, countries will be expected to return with stronger nationally developed uh, contributions to preserve the chance of keeping the average rise in global surface temperatures uh, below two degrees centigrade. Uh, I look at these issues from a European perspective, even though the UK has in a moment of complete madness left the European Union, and the harm which that decision has inflicted uh, is already being felt in, in London. Uh, I hope we'll at least be able to continue cooperation with the EU on energy policy. Um, just considering the three priorities I mentioned in the light of the energy transition, um, and, and, and then um, we'll see what the implications are for policy. Firstly, on cheap energy. Uh, one trend I think about which there's no uh, uh, uncertainty is the increased role of electricity. Electricity consumption uh, is going to continue to rise as its use as a transport fuel spreads very quickly indeed. And my view is it'll spread much more quickly than even the current uh, forecasts suggest. Um, the expansion of electricity intensive data processing technologies will also continue to increase consumption. And this growth in demand for electricity uh, will occur exactly when the phase down of unabated coal eliminates from the market the cheapest form of uh, electricity generation. Uh, and that makes it uh, makes me fear that the price of electricity uh, will continue to rise. The phase down of coal also leads to higher demand for gas, which is clearly going to be widely used for at least the next 25 years. High demand for gas may mean gas prices remain volatile and sometimes therefore high, as Dr. Ellenus uh, suggested. The cost of using fossil fuels will also now be affected by the price of carbon. Less than four years ago, the EU carbon price was languishing below 10 euros a tonne. <coughs> Last week, it went above 65 euros a ton, and some people believe it will rise even further. But whether or not that happens, it's now at a level where it's starting to influence investment decisions, which was, of course, the original idea. The progress made at COP26 on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement will lead to the wider use of carbon pricing uh, in order to encourage and accelerate the transition, not just to clean energy, but also investment in low carbon technology by other industries. So the outcome of COP26 will lead to greater linkage between existing carbon markets and to the establishment of new ones, thus making these markets more efficient and more liquid. And as the use of and, and scope, indeed, of carbon pricing spreads, so its impact on fossil fuel prices uh, will, in my judgment, continue to be upwards. So all these trends together make it probable that cheap fossil fuel energy uh, may, before long, become a thing of the past. Turning to the second priority, the phase down of coal also has implications for energy security. Countries which, depend, which become dependent on imported gas will therefore be more vulnerable than those which have invested in low carbon electricity generation capacity. And that illustrates how early investment in sustainable technology can strengthen a country's energy security. Gas-rich countries like Russia will be able to exploit the weakness of the big importers of gas, and that will enable them to be price setters, not price takers. 
Energy security, however, isn't only about avoiding import dependence. It also requires being able to maintain a continuous supply of electricity. Most new investment in renewable energy now takes place in intermittent forms of electricity generation. I think the case against wind has been pretty convincingly made by uh, Dr. Jollis, uh, with a bit of help, I think, earlier on from um, Dr. Elinas as well. And I, I also am sceptical about the extent to which it's possible for countries to become dependent uh, on wind power. And several European countries have experienced conditions which reminded them about the consequences of that quite recently uh, and significantly increased the risk of power outages. Research by the New Nuclear Watch Institute has shown that if a country depends on intermittent renewables to produce two-thirds or more of its electricity, the cost of the additional storage and the backup generation capacity needed to guarantee a continuous supply of electricity simply becomes too high uh, to be sustained. And so we come to the third priority, green energy. Uh, the, the rise in public concern about climate change is, in my view, now unstoppable. The pressure on investors and lenders, therefore, to switch financial support away from fossil fuels, uh, particularly obviously from coal, to more sustainable alternatives, it, it will soon become overwhelming. And that's not just because of the worry about climate change, but also because of the greater awareness of the damage to human health from the pollution caused by fossil fuel consumption, particularly in urban areas. The opponents of faster action to speed up the energy transition point to the higher cost of most low-carbon technologies. Uh, and it is, of course, undeniable that even after the big fall in the cost of solar energy, these low-carbon technologies remain, for the most part, more expensive than fossil fuels. Partly, I have to say, because of the subsidies, which are still available, uh, and the tax breaks as well, uh, to fossil fuel. Uh, suppliers, but partly also because some fossil fuels don't have to recover to, to cover the cost uh, of disposing of their waste. Anyway, I don't think in the long term price alone will be the de determinant uh, of the future of fossil fuels. Every week now, there's news of changing attitudes. Uh, I read in the Financial Times this morning uh, 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 there are demands from an activist investor uh, in Glencore. Uh, to get them to diverse their coal assets. Uh, and again, in the Financial Times again this morning, the report of the new laws in Greece for the first time to cut coal use uh, within six years. The world we live in is changing fast, but I believe that pace of change is going to get even quicker in the next few years uh, in relation to issues around climate change. So the challenge for governments is how to address the threat of climate change successfully without imposing too much cost and too much disruption on their citizens. Uh, the mismatch, I think, between the time horizon for politicians, of whom I used to be one, uh, and the, and the long-term needs of the uh, energy industry, that point has been very well made by several uh, speakers, and I entirely agree with it. Um, above all, uh, governments need to find a way of ensuring that the energy transition is an economic opportunity uh, and, not, and not a burden. I hope this getting some feedback on the sound here. Um, it, it, inevitably, for most countries, there will be a short-term cost in switching from cheap but dirty technology to cleaner and greener sustainable business models. But even that cost may be more apparent than real because delaying the switch will almost certainly mean that more expensive and more disruption, disruptive action will have to be taken later. And I think that was very much endorsed by the findings from the IEA. That action, incidentally, may not just be needed to address climate change. The European Commission has, in my view, courageously proposed the introduction of carbon uh, border tax adjustments. Not surprisingly, this has met considerable resistance. But a mechanism of this sort will soon be recognised as essential to prevent carbon leakage from part one part of the world to another, as it becomes widely adopted. Countries which rely on fossil fuels may find that their competitive trading positions have been made worse and that the early movers towards sustainable energy are, are rewarded. One symptom of the world, the new world, I would call it, that we live in, is a changing attitude towards nuclear power. In the UK, for the first time for 25 years, the government is backing the building of new nuclear plants. Earlier this year, the Joint Research Centre of the European Commission published a report strongly endorsing nuclear power because of its safety record and its better health and environmental impact than other energy technologies. 
This report reversed decades of ambivalence and often hostility to nuclear energy from the European Commission. And nuclear has a key role now, therefore, alongside other low-carbon energy sources, including solar and wind, in the energy transition. The flexibility offered by advanced and small modular reactors will make it possible for nuclear to be deployed and for well-paid clean jobs to be created in far more places than ever before. And other technologies involved in the energy transition also offer economic opportunities. The IEA has forecast that a 90-fold increase in global hydrogen production is needed by 2030. Sites are already being sought here in Greece by a Polish company, Hydrogen Utopia International, for the development of plants to convert waste plastic into hydrogen using a technology powered in the UK by Powerhouse Energy Group. These are the opportunities which are offered by the energy transition, and there are many more. If they're seized by government and by business alike, they offer humanity the chance of a richer as well as a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hugh, for your presentation. You have been the chairman at the new Nuclear Watch Institute in London, and I was wondering, do you believe there is a high potential nuclear option for those countries in Southeastern Europe they don't yet have it, including Greece? And yes, under what conditions and costs? Because some people skip cost when we discuss nuclear option. Well, I believe that nuclear has got a, an important potential role to play in the energy transition, but each country will have to make its own decision about that, and some are more suited to a nuclear uh, than others. Uh, we do believe that as the development of small uh, advanced modular reactors continues, uh, it will be possible to uh, find nuclear plant which is cheaper than the present very large plants, uh, cheaper per uh, 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 unit of output. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, because they're much smaller, they can be much more flexible in their locations, uh, and therefore they can take nuclear power uh, to places which previously would not have been possible if you have to build a one gigawatt pl uh, capacity plant. So I do think there will be many parts of southeastern Europe, including Greece, where it will be possible for nuclear energy to be uh, uh, a, a, a significant factor. And I do think that it is likely that it's difficult for renewables to fill the complete gap, uh, which is going to be created by the re reduction in both coal and gas use. Thank you. Thank you. Let's um, move on to our next and final guest and uh, speaker, Dr. Nasi Gorban, who has been Secretary to the Environment and Energy Commission of the International Chamber of Commerce, the Iran Committee. Good morning to Tehran. Uh, good afternoon to you. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the conference board and especially Dr. Stamlis for inviting me to this uh, gathering. Uh, I learned a lot in the past few uh, hours. Uh, I have been to an IENE conference many times, but it's the first time that uh, uh, I'm joining via Zoom, and uh, I'm not so used to it, to be honest with you. Uh, I hope the speed of internet, as I said, would allow me to uh, present uh, my case. Uh, what I uh, saw is that the, my uh, learned speakers before me have given you a very comprehensive view of everything that could be said almost about this thing. So I'm trying to say a little bit uh, more than, uh, uh, you know, not the same thing to not repeat, but also to give you a, probably a different angle of the whole thing. Uh, let me start with uh, a very brief history of what happened in, uh, after the uh, impact uh, as you all know, and you've heard, uh, global GDP fell by 3.5%, primary energy consumption fell by 4.5%, carbon emission also fell by 6.3% due to uh, lack of movements and lack of uh, activity. These were, these were uh, the lowest since 1945, uh, first of all. 
the term for global investment, which is the most important thing, and my then speakers uh, previously uh, mentioned that also dropped by around 30 percent. These are the disasters that happened uh, uh, in 2020. Of course, with the oil, it was the worst. Uh, the pandemic uh, uh, caused it was worse than the, you know with regard to oil. It was worse than the Swiss Canal crisis in 1956. Uh, Oil embargo of 1973, Iranian revolution of 74, 79, when 4 million barrels were taken out of the market, and Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. And uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm old enough to remember all of them. Uh, so uh, we know that the global oil consumption fell by 9.3%. Prices dropped in April 2020 to $20 per barrel, although at the end of the year, it uh, ended up uh, an average of $42 in, uh, for 2020, which was still below 35% below 2019. And we have the same scenarios, more or less, for gas and coal, uh, but less uh, dramatic. Uh, natural gas consumption uh, was down 2.3%. Of course, while at the same time the share of gas increased mainly because uh, the other stuff, the price of gas in U.S. averaged around uh, two dollars per million uh, which was probably the lowest since 1995. Asian LNG prices, which were uh, two years ago at around fifteen dollars, uh, hit four point four dollars per million BTU. Coal consumption was down uh, in OECD by 4.2%, and uh, uh, nuclear energy was also dropped by 4.1%. These were, these were what happened with the COVID. Uh, on the other side, the renewable energy grew by 9.7% in the same year. Of course, it was slower than the average rate of growth that they had in the past uh, 10 years. But still, it was uh, good that they had a positive growth. Uh, solar energy amongst them was the best, 20% uh, high. Uh, and uh, hydroelectricity grew by only 1%, mainly in China. The share of renewables in power generations also increased uh, uh, from 10.3% to about 11.7%, uh, while coal share fell. Now, these were these, uh, what happened in 2020. But what will happen? What, the, what are the trends? At, at least what we can imagine could be the trends. And there are two major forces that have contributed to the recent changes. It was basically the uh, policies of the, the COP uh, in 2015, uh, and also the climate change uh, the pandemic. Pandemic and the climate change were the two main reasons. And these are going hand in hand to change the uh, energy scene in the world. And it will create a changing pattern of the future consumption and investment, particularly investment in energy. Now, <clears throat> if you're moving towards zero carbon emission that everybody has talked about, uh, will have to be reduce the demand for hydrocarbons. Uh, for now, uh, last year, the lockdowns and change of habits of movement of work and traveling and et cetera, including when I'm now talking to you in Zoom and stop being there, uh, all of these uh, uh, were the causes of uh, uh, this uh, pandemic and uh, uh, the changes that happened uh, recently. We know that coal and oil will be the first to be impacted when we have uh, when we are going into the future. Uh, natural gas will follow soon, but it will be less affected. Uh, renewables will replace first coal and oil and the production of electricity. It was been many people talk about it just two minutes ago. Uh, then we have the problem of investment. The climate change policies forced 
the reduction of use of investment in hybrid gardens. Yeah, many, many big companies, many big investors have refused to put money in coal or oil. The, the renewables, although they, are, they have a healthy growth, but have a long way to replace the energy needs of the most countries. And uh, this, uh, this period of transition would be the most important issue that we have to address. Uh, as the world economic growth is back to normal gradually in 2021 and maybe further, uh, oil and gas still have a big share of the primary energy. It will have it for many years to come, although we wish to reduce. Uh, <clears throat> let me look at uh, the global reserves of oil and gas, and that uh, maybe uh, it gives an idea of uh, uh, what will happen. Uh, we know that two thirds of the world oil reserves are situated in nine, nine countries. Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Iran, Iraq, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, UAE, and US. Again, 70%, even more than two thirds of the world gas reserves are also in nine countries. Russia, Iran, Qatar, Turkmenistan, US, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Nigeria. Now, when you look at the, uh, who has, uh, uh, a lot of oil and gas reserves. We, we talk of a club of 300, 300 billion barrels oil equivalent of oil and gas. When you look at this, we have four countries. We have Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Russian Federation uh, that have 300 billion barrels or more oil equivalent you know, of gas and oil. So these four countries uh, are the last to use these resources. And they want to make sure that these resources are used to create wealth for the future generation. Uh, now, <clears throat> if you look at the production of the oil, again, 68% of the world oil production is in nine countries. US, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, Iraq, UAE, Iran, Brazil, and Kuwait. And again, 67% of the world gas is in nine countries. US, Russia, Iran, China, Qatar, Canada, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Norway. So we see that the, uh, the, the social and political pressure which has uh, uh, created in order to stop investment uh, in, uh, in the businesses of kind of hydrocarbon businesses will affect these countries uh, more than others. Uh, <clears throat> the problem now that we're facing this transitional period is that the collapse of demand uh, uh, is Mr. Govan still with us? Lost connection. The price of oil dollars about this has the effect of the shale gas fix. Uh, there has been no uh, uh, there has been no investment for oil development in Venezuela, Iraq, and Iran. And this is very important to know that over one third of the world oil reserves are hidden in these three countries. There has been no absolutely no investment as such. The real investment in these countries. The problem to some extent in Iraq, but the rest not. <clears throat> now, we know all of us know that oil fields production decline around the world uh, is five and eight percent yearly. The decline in oil production is between five and eight percent around the world in different oil fields. Uh, in 2019, we had 95 million barrels per day of oil production. By 2025, if you do not have investments to replace this oil, uh, then you will have to compensate for around 13 million barrels per day of oil production. This is just for the decline. But, but there is no investment. There is no investment committed to uh, compensate for this. 
Now, as the uh, we, we witnessed in 2020, as the uh, economic growth began to show itself, uh, suddenly you have the shortages. You have the shortages of uh, fuels in Europe, and the prices uh, are more than double the average of price of 2020 at the present. Let me give you an interesting example of uh, uh, reserve and production uh, in, the, uh, in some countries. The imbalance. You see that in the United States, we have 4% of the oil reserves, <clears throat> while Iran and Venezuela have 26.6% of the world reserves. However, the production in the United States is 18.6%, while the production of the world, while the production of Iran and Venezuela of the world is only 4.1%. So it shows that uh, these two big, uh, these two countries with huge reserves, with 26.6% of the world reserve, which is 6.6 .6 times the US reserves, they produce only one third, one fourth of the US production. Uh, here there is a big imbalance there. Uh, and also, if you look at the gas, it would be the same thing. And you see that, uh, for example, the US uh, reserve is 6.7%, Iran and Qatar together, 30%. The, uh, production is 3% versus 10.9%. So again, it shows that uh, the 22% of the reserves of Iran and Qatar, US produces uh, more than double the time, double the uh, Iran and Qatar production. Now, this, this imbalance uh, uh, will eventually have to uh, be sorted out uh, if the, if the, if the uh, economics uh, allow, if they if the, that intervention in the market. The countries with large oil and gas reserves and cheap cost of production will increase the share of production, obviously. Uh, Venezuela and Iran due to sanctions, with, as I said, 27%, about 26.6% of the world reserves, have, has not been able to attract any investment in oil and gas. So this can, cannot be sustained. Lack of investment in oil and gas, if, it, if lack of investment in oil and gas continues, the price of the increase. Uh, sooner or later, we're going to see that probably by 2025. Uh, lower prices will slow down the development of the renewable energy and moving away from that. But this is, in, the, in fact, the opposite of what we say. But if, uh, if we, what we think is that the prices are going to go up, it would be good for the renewable So <clears throat> let me conclude uh, saying that the uh, COVID-19, in addition to climate change policies, uh, have changed the supply demand pattern of energy in the past few years, and it will have an immense effect in the uh, way of thinking of the uh, future. And uh, the uncertainty of future demand on price of oil has curtailed investment in oil and gas industry worldwide, which is very damaging to the transition of time that we are facing. Unless a prudent global policy on investment for energy is formed, the future of the world economic growth and the success of controlling climate change will face severe difficulties. Political considerations, sanctions, and imbalance between production from different regions have contributed to high and volatile price of oil and will hinder smooth transition from hydrocarbons to a newer form of energy in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gorban. Thank you for this uh, extended and detailed overview of the current situation. As we run out of time, I suggest we take a couple of questions from the audience and perhaps uh, a final point from our honorary guests and speakers. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. If you can please tell us your name and capacity. Thank you. I have a question related to, to the gas and to the nuclear. Uh, in fact, uh, I was very much provoked by what uh, Tim Neo said. Um, I just want to recall one legal fact. 
Uh, this year in the summer, I think it was in June, the European Union adopted a regulation on the Just Transition Fund, where both nuclear and fossil fuels, I want to underline it's not about coal, it's about fossil fuels, which includes also gas, are excluded explicitly from any kind of support, financial support. I mean, the construction of new capacities uh, included. Uh, and uh, from this point of view, I'm a little bit confused, and I'd like to hear the opinion of, uh, of our speakers, because on the one side, there is a clear legal rule in this aspect, and on the other side, for example, the European Commission very much promotes the inter interconnector, the gas interconnector between Bulgaria and Greece as an element of, of the uh, regional energy security. So if uh, our distingu distinguished speakers are so kind and are in the position to advise the Commission, what would be their key message related to the role of nuclear and, uh, and uh, gas in, uh, in the near future? I heard your positions, but evidently the Commission needs more arguments because, as I said, legally, they have made very strict, uh, very strict uh, regulation in this aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Year, would you like to? Yes, uh, I would. Um, I, I think that the European Commission is being completely unrealistic in taking uh, the view that uh, neither gas nor nuclear uh, has any role to play. Uh, as I said, uh, when I was speaking earlier, uh, gas has clearly got a big role to play, at least for the next 25 years. Uh, and I would argue uh, that nuclear also has an essential role. It won't be as big as gas because gas got a much bigger share of the energy market. But nuclear still has an important role. Uh, and I think one of the other presenters made the point that a very cost effective way to find low carbon electricity right now is just to give life extensions to existing nuclear plants. So I think the European Commission has been, it's been, it's been um, uh, somewhat inconsistent in its thinking. It, I mentioned the report that the Joint Research Centre published, I think it was April this year, which made a perfectly good case for nuclear on safety and health and environmental grounds. Um, uh, but there's some ambivalence still, obviously, in the attitude of the, of the European Commission, and that's regrettable because uh, we can't afford to have arguments about which technologies we're going to have. We need them all. I've got coal, I think, is going to struggle to survive very much longer, but we need all these lower carbon technologies, and we need them fast, uh, and it would be a mistake to try and reject them. Thank you. Dr. Elmans, would you like to um, elaborate more? Yeah, I, have a, I have a couple of... And first of all, based on, uh, on IEA's data, uh, we need to invest two, two to three times more in renewables to achieve net zero by 2050. And also, in terms of technologies, out of the 40 or so technologies needed, only a small number have progressed satisfactorily. So, would you put your future into that? Would you say that let's shut down nuclear, let's shut down coal, and reduce the use of gas, hoping that these things are going to happen? What happens if they don't? And experience so far has shown that it's not these investments, these developments do not happen at the rate we want them. And I think the European Union and the United States, as a result of this energy crisis, they have realized that there is a potential problem here. And that's why the European Union, on the one hand, is now changing its taxonomy to enable use of nuclear and gas for a, they call it a temporary period, up until 2030, to allow nuclear plants and um, gas plants to be built between now and 2030 to ensure continuity of supplies. And Lo and behold, Germany, that is leading Europe in terms of renewables, the new coalition said that they will eliminate coal by 2030 and will increase the contribution of renewables to power generation to 80%. What they haven't said publicly is that quietly they have also decided to increase the, uh, the use of natural gas, the capacity of natural gas power plants by 50% to 2030. 
to enable these ha things to happen. So, so even the Germans are building more gas plants to ensure that their renewable targets are met. In the United States, something again happened that has been has gone unnoticed. If you remember when Biden was elected, he froze leasing of public lands for use uh, by oil and gas companies for leasing. Last, this, last week, they decide, made, they made a decision on that. Apparently, they are going to unfreeze the leasing of public, pla public lands, and the only thing they are going to do is to, le to increase the lease costs substantially and use that money to invest in energy transition. A very sensible decision. So it seems to me that both Europe and the United States realized as a result of this energy crisis we are going through at the moment, that maybe, maybe there have been too moving too fast, too soon uh, in the direction of renewables. And they're now even, in a sense, Germany as well, trying to retrace the balance. And I think the decisions being made in the United States with the public lands, the leasing of public lands, and the changes in taxonomy in Europe are sensible. And they will enable transition to happen in a more orderly manner. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Dr. Elinas. Um, yes, may I invite our guests and speakers to uh, final comments? If there is no other question from the audience. Yes, Mr. Petropoulos. Oh. Brief question, please, because we ran out of time. Uh, Mr. Coordinator, I would like to pose two questions to the panel. Colonel Zesekas from the Institute for the Permanent Education, Ministry of Defense. Uh, dear professors, I would like to, to pose the first question. Um, dear uh, Dr. Mr. Elinas, from one hand, we've got the carbon. You already told us advantages, disadvantages. For example, we've got the autonomy, but on the other hand, we've got the fuels. On the other hand, we've got the gas, or let's say the imported fuels. So in this way, they become expensive. So in this way, we've, we face other challenges, not only as a country, as European Union. In the middle, I would say we've got the renewable energy. So the question is, and you also said about the society and we have to be sensible, we have to be, to take care about the society and so on. So the question is, what kind of motives should we give to the society, to the citizens, in order to invest even little money, simultaneously with the big enterprises and so on. For example, the 10 kilowatt program that every citizen on his roof can build and so on and so on. And the second question would be for the first speaker of our panel. So the question is about the infrastructure for the electromobility, as you already mentioned. What do you think, what measures you think we should take in order to improve the infrastructure? Because, okay, we've got the electric cars, but now we need to improve the infrastructure. Should we put money to the gas stations all over the country? Should we put money to the supermarkets as they are doing on abroad? Or do we have some other measures, perhaps? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. So in terms of electromobility, of course, you need to enhance the infrastructure out there, right? For example, UK recently took a, a decision that every new house that it's going to build, it has to have a recharging point, uh, point out there. So this is also combined with the battery developments there because they are planning to come additional, more advanced technologies in batteries that it will facilitate the range anxiety. So, of course, public infrastructure is needed. For this reason also, we, we heard big plans from China, France, UK, Germany, all over the world in order to enhance that. But also at some point, this anxiety that is coming for the consumer, it's going to be alleviated due to technology developments out there. I will say that we are not in a position that we have so big electric fleet that it's not possible. To, to fuel, to power that with electricity. But of course, governments need to keep a close eye on that and, and to enhance the investments. So I, I would like to do some remarks also about what I have heard and the, just to add on the conversation. So 
A key question for me is that, is that Europe the only one that they have uh, net zero targets? The question is no, it's not the only one. So we have key oil producers, like recently Saudi Arabia announced a net zero target by 2060. United Arab Emirates announced. Even Russia announced a net zero out there. US, because I, I listened about the package there, you, uh, President Biden have put on forward a target about 50% of electric car sales to be electric by 2030. Canada is expecting to ban IC sales by 2035, which is also a big oil and gas producer country. So the question is that it's not Europe alone. And on the other side, we see also industry to follow that. For example, Volkswagen announced that it's going to phase out the sales of petrol cars at Europe. We have also Ford on, on board on that. We have General Motors on board on that, which is a big producer, especially in the US. So this just to put some aspects about the clean energy transition and what is a current uh, policy framework out there. And just an open question to everyone is that if we don't act now, do we really have the time for the coming decades? Because it's not IEA or uh, European Commission, it's all the institutes. IPCCS just warned that if we don't reach net carbon neutrality by 2050, we are going to have huge implications. We'll have heat waves, floods, we'll create an unsustainable planet out there. So what we really need of course there are barriers out there we know that wind cannot operate 100 percent we know that solar cannot operate 100 percent but still we know that people they are facing air pollution out there we we know that when also in our countries we are leaving some impacts of the climate change already so the key question is that that how much time do we have in order to be prepared and to do a smooth transition. Right, thank you. Any other points from uh, the speakers? Oh, you, oh you, yes, yes, please. Yeah, in answer to the question about investment, in answer to the question about investment in renewables by, by ordinary people, I, I don't think they will do that unless they have faith in that investment, unless they believe that it's the current debate in Greece is confusing. It's uh, uh, no question Greece is making commitments to moving to renewables. No question that it needs wind energy. The problem is that there is a, a confused dis a, a discussion at the moment that uh, ordinary people in the street, if they follow that, they will shy away from it. They will not invest. They will also be concerned about the future of renewables. So first of all, Greece needs to decide, it's the, the government, the institutions need to decide that um, uh, clean energy is needed, convince everybody that there is a clear way forward, and then investments will, fo will follow, not the other way around. Thank you, great. Should I make a closing remark? And yes, please. Yeah. So ahead. very quickly, I mean, I said what I said before, I, I, I still, as I said before, the, because of these changes in, uh, caused by the energy crisis in Europe and the US, there is a re realization that maybe energy transition is happening too fast and that uh, g gas and nuclear have a role to play at least during energy transition and at least until we are confident that the clean energy is ready to take over. I, I agree completely with IEA about the longer term plans. But countries also made promises in Paris about IDCs and they haven't delivered. Doesn't mean that because they promised net zero by 2050, they will deliver. Out of all of these countries that promised net zero, only a very small handful have made it legally binding. The rest of them are just words. So if gas is going to be needed, I agree with Bassam that it has to be decarbonized. CCS, carbon capture and storage, is going to be part of the equation. Without it, it's going to be difficult to justify use of gas <coughs> as we go towards 2030. Thank you. Uh, can, can I come in uh, just on the energy crisis, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Would you allow me? Yeah. yeah. Briefly, yes. Well, uh, I, I think what is quite uh, what I found about the current energy crisis quite interesting is that it has divided people into two camps, and these two camps are very far apart. 
Actually, one camp sees the crisis as evidence of the importance of the role of hydrocarbons in the energy mix and why it's important to continue to invest in the hydrocarbon sector. And, uh, you know, uh, basically that camp makes the argument that even as the world transition to cleaner energy sources, hydrocarbons will continue to play a key role. And exiting too early or under-investing in this sector actually will cause disruptions, uh, it will result in high energy prices and real hardship for individuals. But it's quite also important to point that there's another camp that actually argue that this is as is a living proof as to why the world should accelerate the move away from hydrocarbons towards renewable energy. Um, the arguments are made is that hydro, uh, hydrocarbons actually are not only expensive, uh, but also unreliable. I think that the, a key issue with this uh, camp is that they are living in the future in a world which is completely decarbonized, even though not all the technologies to get us there are mature. And even if we have the technologies, there are no viable business and economic models uh, that have been built around them. I would say that they're also not very open about the cost and the impacts on getting there uh, without any hydrocarbons. Uh, I think there is some thinking that high cost of hydrocarbons is needed uh, 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 to accelerate the, the energy transition and push people towards the alternative. Uh, however, I think this, this is really myopic, if that's the case, because if costs rise and disruptions become more frequent, actually this could delay the transitions and individuals and countries can push against the greed agenda. And of course, this also eradicates uh, energy poverty and improving energy access and actually the entire concept of just energy transition. I think, you know, the issue is not about getting, it's not only about getting to a destination, but also about how to get there in the most efficient, the least costly way, the least disruptive way, the most inclusive way, and also the most environmental friendly way. Uh, because as disruptions happen, and as we, you know, and we saw this in Europe, you know, you see all sorts of substitution that actually can increase emissions. For instance, in Europe, we saw switching from gas to coal. In Asia, we have seen substitution from gas uh, to oil. And these actually had the, have the effect of increasing rather than uh, reducing uh, emissions. So the issue is really not about the destination. I think everyone on this panel agree on the destination. I think the issue is basically how to get there in the most cost-effective, most efficient, and most inclusive way, and also in the most environmental friendly way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, uh, who else? Team? Yeah. Anybody from the speakers? We cannot hear you. Mr. Hero. Yes. I get this off. Yes, please. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, just very briefly, um, uh, uh, only two countries ever decarbonize their energy system as fast as every country is going to have to do that and do so now. Uh, those were France and Sweden in the wake of the 1973-74 oil crisis. And they both did so by a very rapid uh, investment in new nuclear capacity. Second point is that the two technologies the world most needs, in my view, are uh, economically viable carbon capture and storage uh, uh, and better electricity storage. With those two, we unlock the potential for much more efficient energy systems. Mr. Drollers, Dr. Drollers, would you like to make a final point? Um, I would like to make a point regarding Greece. Um, I believe, but I might be wrong, that the Greek government is not encouraging the uh, 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 drilling or uh, for hydrocarbons. It sort of put it on the back burner. And that, that is very puzzling and worrying for Greece, because even if you don't use more hydrocarbons or you don't wish to use more hydrocarbons, it doesn't mean that you can't export them to those countries and those regions that would like to use them and would wish to use them for their development. So um, I would like someone maybe uh, to sort of confirm that, that that is the case, or is, am I mistaken? But it's a very disturbing development. Thank you. Dr. Gorbin, final point. Yeah. I think that uh, the only thing that I want to mention uh, is that uh, I, I refer back to the investment. You know, the, the, the level of investment in the oil and gas 
and uh, other resources has to be balanced in such a way that we can do the transition properly. Thank you very much all. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you audience. Thank you distinguished Thank you. guests and speakers. Time for lunch break, I believe. Bear with us. Uh, more to come uh, in the afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>